So you've developed Parkinson's disease. Welcome to the club. But what does it mean and how will it affect you? This is an introduction to Parkinson's disease and in part one we're looking at it's not just a tremor. No, Parkinson's disease is not just a tremor. It's becoming increasingly usual for a consultation with your GP to look at one condition only. But Parkinson's displays a range of apparently disconnected symptoms that might make positive diagnosis elusive. None of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease is unique to the PD condition. Even the key indicators can be caused by alcohol and drug excess or dependency, the after effects of sudden shock or trauma, intense anxieties, shock and nervousness, extreme tiredness and fatigue, and a range of other factors. So let's take stock of the situation. The chances are that for your diagnosis to be made, you are displaying several indicative symptoms. Usually, you will be showing at least one of the bradykinesia symptoms and a couple of other indicative symptoms as well. Bradykinesia is literally the slow or diminished movement of the body's musculature and its effects. Parkinson's disease symptoms usually emerge slowly, which has probably made early diagnosis of your condition difficult. You've probably already discovered that Parkinson's disease is a long-term degenerative disorder of the central nervous system. It mainly affects the body's motor systems, muscular and movement control. But as it progresses, non-motor symptoms become more apparent. The symptoms usually emerge slowly, which means that they can still appear after a diagnosis has been made. How is Parkinson's disease caused? We don't know. How is Parkinson's disease cured? At present, there is no specific cure for Parkinson's disease, but it responds well to treatment. That it responds well to treatment is probably a cause for optimism. Parkinson's disease will not of itself threaten our lives. It will not even shorten our lives in any meaningful sense. Statistically, we might lose one and a bit years of our life expectancy, but that's assuming that you know what your life expectancy was going to be in the first place. However, care will be needed as some of the symptoms can put us into life-threatening situations. How can this happen? Typically, a loss of balance is characteristic of Parkinson's disease. Inevitably, this will lead to falls and stumbles. But a fall from a bicycle can leave us in the middle of a busy road which can be life-threatening. Drivers don't always allow us the time and space that we need, even when we are pedestrians. Another typical symptom of Parkinson's disease is fenestration, which is the shortening of our steps as we walk. Sometimes fenestration means that our head gets there faster than our feet and we fall, perhaps with painful results.
As we become more aware of some of the symptoms, we might ask, could we have been experiencing symptoms before any diagnosis of Parkinson's disease was made? The answer is almost certainly yes. We almost certainly had symptoms before diagnosis because there is no single test to confirm the Parkinson's disease condition. These symptoms might sometimes have been dismissed by the medical profession because they appeared to be minor symptoms that did not relate to any specific condition. Hindsight has 2020 vision, but medical uncertainties can cause us anxiety and even stress. We know the symptoms occur in two very distinct classes. Class one is the motor symptoms, the muscular and movement symptoms. These can appear as tremor, rigidity, slowness of movement, falls and dizziness, freezing, which can mean the muscles literally freeze immobile. It can happen when we stand up from a chair, walk through a doorway, or even when we are crossing a road. A muscular cramps and dystonia. This is when the muscles stiffen and shorten, which can result in pain and discomfort. This sometimes happens when carrying out a particular task or activity. It's unusual for anyone to have all of these symptoms. We know that people can experience Parkinson's symptoms before anyone can achieve a diagnosis. But when a diagnosis is made, the treatment should quickly bring the symptoms under some sort of control. The main issue after diagnosis is that we take our medication on time, every time and in the recommended dosage so that our Parkinson's disease specialist can balance the medications and progressively tune the chemical intake into our bodies to meet our exact requirements. Medication can usually be taken orally. We might need to find an appropriate dispenser to keep our doses in order. And we might want to multi-alarm to keep our timings accurate. It's also worth keeping fluids handy to help us swallow the tablets. It's worth making a note of our symptoms, when they occur and how they affect us. We can also note when and how these symptoms disappear with treatment and any symptoms that have not disappeared so far. This will usually build positive confidence in the treatment. It's also important to note any new symptoms as they appear and how they affect us. We should also bring these new symptoms to the attention of our GP or our PD specialist, as they may require a slight modification to our treatment plan. One of the challenges of Parkinson's is that it takes a variety of forms. Very few people show all the symptoms. Many people present different symptoms in a different order and with different intensities and effects. It's sometimes even described as several different illnesses that form the common group of Parkinsonism each presenting the same range of symptoms and responding to the same treatments, but coming from apparently different sources. It doesn't really matter if we call it Parkinson's disease, Parkinsonism, PD, or simply the condition. We still have to cope with the challenges. The second class is the non-motor symptoms, which are more difficult to anticipate and often a little more scary. They include 
low blood pressure, bladder and bowel problems, restless leg syndrome, fatigue, sweating and skin dampness, sleep disorders, compulsive and obsessive behaviours, eating, swallowing and saliva issues, speech and communication control issues, eye problems, foot care issues, mouth and dental issues, memory and recall problems, difficulties in concentration, anxieties, hallucinations and delusions, depression, apathy, onset of dementia, and general pain and discomfort. So you see, it's not just a tremor. Continuing to work with Parkinson's disease gives you an advantage over the other people you meet and with whom you engage. You know how you feel day to day. Others only see how you behave. It's probably worth keeping a diary or an electronic log to track how you're coping with your condition on a day to day basis. When are things better? When are things worse? When do colleagues notice things and perhaps even intervene? Can I work out why this is happening? The class one symptoms can be coded with the capital letters A, B, C, D, E, etc. And the class two non-motor symptoms can be coded with lowercase letters A, B, C, D, etc. And each symptom can be given a score daily from say naught to six, where zero is no effect on my day whatsoever. And six is that the symptom has been a serious inconvenience to you during the day. We know that people can become anxious and possibly even stressed by the range of non-motor symptoms that seem to be normal for the Parkinson's disease condition. But it's very unlikely anyone will get all or even most of these symptoms. And because the symptoms are known about, treatments are usually available. It's important that we tell our GP or Parkinson's clinician what is happening if new symptoms arise. We must accept that some of the less well-known symptoms of Parkinson's disease can cause anxiety, embarrassment and even stress, particularly if they happen in the workplace. Planning how best to deal with situations before they arise is better than being caught by surprise and having to rush. We might never experience any of the following symptoms, but many PD sufferers do, so be prepared. Anxiety in social groups. Many PD sufferers feel totally inexplicable, undue and unexpected anxiety when they're in a social group. It can be a feeling that arrives even when we are already participating in the group activity. It doesn't really seem to matter if it's a group of strangers or one where we are already known and respected. We try to anticipate this possibility when the group is first gathering. Try to get a position where we are part of the group, but not in the group. It seems to help if we're in a position where we cannot be surprised by the people around us, such as this one in the example. In a different circumstance, this might be called the gunfighter's position, sitting with our backs to the wall and facing the entrance. Social distancing has lessened this issue considerably, but be prepared. A more extreme example is finding ourselves in a crowd and experiencing a genuine sense of fear without any just cause. 
there may be no sense of threat or danger, just a feeling of being afraid of the crowd itself. Again, social distancing has lessened this risk, but again, be prepared. Trying to find ways to lessen our perception of the crowd is a good idea. Move to the edges, focus on details, engage closely with one or two people and shut out the mass, or restrict our view, looking at the ground and the feet immediately around you. Make the crowd smaller in your mind to reduce the fear. Experiencing a feeling of time pressure can sometimes provoke anxieties. This might happen at a supermarket checkout, for instance, especially if others are waiting behind you. The feeling can be made worse because sometimes our coordination makes us clumsy and trying to handle shopping quickly can simply increase the pressures. It's worth keeping a patience badge in our purse or pocket that we can display at appropriate times. It's amazing how well people usually respond to this simple aid. When something upsets or irritates us, there's a tendency for PD sufferers to sometimes lose patience and respond aggressively. There's no point in saying don't lose your temper because it would not happen if we could control it. So take the time to apologize to those concerned as soon as the aggression has passed. Again, it can help to show a PD patience badge to support your apology or just to remind your colleagues of your condition. Incontinence can sometimes be an issue. Don't pretend it isn't happening. Use protective products in a timely way. Don't let pride result in embarrassment or even degradation. Protection is easily obtained and modern products are very effective, especially against slight bladder leakage. One set of symptoms can appear in complete contradiction with each other. We are sometimes able to show considerable patience and perseverance in a task or activity. Yet we can demonstrate almost irrational impatience and frustration if something or someone interrupts our concentration. Again, there's no point in saying don't do this because it wouldn't happen if we could control it. But we can try to control the situation so that we can anticipate the interruptions. Try to avoid being taken by surprise. Try to express your frustrations when you are still alone. Or practice saying, sorry. This patience and perseverance can sometimes lead to a less desirable symptom. It can sometimes lead to obsessive behaviours and habits that we find difficult to control. Obviously, a gambling habit is one we need to be careful about particularly when employment gives us a reliable source of income. Illegal substance and alcohol abuse can also become a problem for Parkinson's disease sufferers, or it can simply be a hard to control shopping habit. Family, friends, and even trusted work colleagues can help us to guard against obsessive habits and behavior. Family, friends and work colleagues can also help us with frozen face syndrome. 
Even close friends, loved ones and family members sometimes forget that relaxing or having to concentrate can lead us to showing totally emotionless and disengaged expression and body language. This can convey boredom, disinterest or even annoyance when this is not in any way the mood we are experiencing. Make sure those close to you understand this and can warn you when expression and body language seem out of phase with your mood. But remember, frozen face syndrome will not automatically make you unbeatable as a poker player. You need skill, nerve and luck as well. Don't be tempted beyond your abilities. A real difficulty for PD sufferers is that we think we look like this. But in fact, this is the image we are conveying. We must try to be aware of our facial signals Use mirrors whenever possible to check your expression. And again, we can make sure that someone close to us can warn us when our body language and facial expression appear to be out of phase with our moods. A high risk symptom when we are still employed is forgetfulness. As a mild symptom, this can happen quite early in the condition. In fact, Lewy body's dementia can occur before a Parkinson's disease diagnosis is even made. When it is observed, it can cause great anxiety for everyone involved. As it develops, we should try to make sure that we have memory aids for the things that matter. Acronyms, prompts, notes, checklists and any aid memoir that we can create can help relieve the stress. The main advice is not to panic when we have a memory lapse. The memory is in there somewhere. Just wait for it to return. There is often a fear that forgetfulness will become Alzheimer's. In very general terms, Alzheimer's means the brain never takes in the memory of experiences. There are situations and things that Alzheimer's sufferer will simply never perceive. With dementia, the memory is perceived, but it can be difficult to find and recall it from the brain later. The symptom for Parkinson's disease is dementia. Parkinson's disease does not lead to Alzheimer's. Dementia can become totally debilitating, but the deterioration is usually slow and extreme dementia usually happens very late in Parkinson's disease development. Another limiting factor for PD can be insomnia and sleep apnea. This can obviously be a particular risk if our job entails driving or operating machinery. But any sleeplessness can damage our ability to work effectively. It's important to bring this to the attention of our GP or our Parkinson clinician as soon as possible and that we follow their advice. It's likely they can recommend a modification to our treatment that will quickly improve the condition. The main thing is to keep ourselves and others safe. It's okay for PD sufferers to be alone in their thoughts and interests. But apathy and depression can develop without companionship 
and social interaction. And this can happen to partners and families as well as to ourselves. Coronavirus isolation is pushing this threat hard because it often means that we are isolated from our usual social groups and social interactions. Don't let your work isolate you. It's important we maintain our social contacts. It is important we take care of our loved ones and those who care for us. The next slide in our programme for Parkinson's sufferers who are still employed lists some of the less well-known symptoms that Parkinson's can bring about. These symptoms should not be looked for, but simply recognised and accepted if and when they are observed. They should, however, be noted and possibly reported to your clinical support. Although they are all anticipated side effects that might occur in Parkinson's disease, they can also have other causes. Your GP or PD clinician can make sure it's not a symptom of something else and probably successfully deal with it by modifying your treatment. I don't intend to read out all of these questions, but they are available for you to take as a screenshot or you can get a copy directly from us. There are no copyright issues involved so if you think this slide might be useful, by all means, make use of it. In summary, a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is difficult in itself. Once we have come to terms with the diagnosis, the surprise is how invasive the condition can become. The side effects often cause us greater concern than the expected bradykinesia symptoms. These non-motor symptoms usually cause most concern. Non-motor symptoms cannot be predicted, so they take us by surprise and often cause a real challenge when they do. Try to work with Parkinson's disease not to work against it. We bend with the pressure. Don't let the pressures break us. PD is as much a psychological challenge as it is a physical one. The psychology is sometimes missed. Thus, our theme has been, it's not just a tremor. And a final caution. The longer term effects of coronavirus seem to strongly overlap some of the symptoms of Parkinsonism. If you are continuing in employment with Parkinson's disease, it is probably worth taking every care practical to avoid a coronavirus infection. Coronavirus might turn out to be the greater threat. This program has been brought to you by the Newark and District Parkinson's Group. Everyone is welcome to join us. You don't have to have Parkinson's. You don't even have to care for someone with Parkinson's. You just have to care. For more information or just to make contact, email alexkeef at icloud.com or John Miller at millway.net. And in the meantime, look out for part two of this series An Introduction to Parkinson's Disease, Part Two What's in a Name? This will be a brief history of the development and treatment of Parkinsonism, PD, 
or Parkinson's disease over the ages. Thanks for watching. Hope you found it useful. Hope you've enjoyed some of it at least. Goodbye now.